the network right, should not discriminate, and the network should not be able to differentiate between different types of people. Uh, of course, hopefully, we'll all use the network for, for both good and for awesome. OK, so that's part of the mathematical underpinning. Today, we're going to look at this idea of consensus. And consensus is, well, consensus, let's go to the next slide. What means when I say consensus? What do you think of when I say consensus? Agreement. Agreement. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, does everybody agree with that? Or, or does anybody disagree? Some, sometimes you get like half the class agreeing, but you miss that small portion that are like, oh, I wanted to say something. Right. Um, so consensus as agreement. What do we think? Is that OK? Yeah. A few people nodding, nodding in agreement. Uh, anything else? Oh, and maybe also it's in the protocol. OK, OK. Consensus isn't just in blockchain protocols. Consensus has been around for a long time. We draw the idea straight from social consensus. And so you know, in a small group of people come to consensus, the classic one is like friends going out for dinner, trying to decide on a place that you want to eat at. You know, what type of food do we want to eat? Has anyone heard of a new place? Oh, this place was good. I recommend we go here. What do you think? Oh, it's too far. And a short back and forth, hopefully not too long, and you can decide where to go. So this idea of social consensus, you know, it's been around forever, as long as humans have been communicating, coming to agreement such that all parties involved are OK with the outcome. Everybody thinks that's an acceptable place to dine. If I did not think it was a good place, you know, maybe I might see you later. Or we'll catch up next time. By the time we get to large groups of people, it gets a little bit more tricky, right? Try to, or, or try to organize a big group of people. You probably have had to do this at some point, and it gets extremely difficult. Try to organize, even like at the size of the university, trying to organize all these groups into classrooms and a timetable. That's a, that's a really hard problem. Trying to organize a whole country such that everybody not necessarily as an agreement, but everybody is directionally aligned is the job of you know, politics or democracy, or in our case here, a parliament. And so social consensus, very important. And it, you know, what we do by electing politicians is we know that we don't have the expertise or the time to study up on all these issues. Right? I don't want to go and research the effects that vaping you know, has on teenagers. But I'm quite happy to let somebody else do that. I'm quite happy to let somebody else decide how to spend the taxpayer money so that the roads get fixed and, and various other things. You know, because I got I got things to do, right? Like I gotta plug in all this stuff. You know, I got my TikTok audience to grow. Like I'm a, I'm a busy man. And if I had to stop and put up my hand and agree and disagree with all the individual decisions, you know, we wouldn't really get anywhere. Um, and so what we're doing is we're we're submitting our authority when we agree to this parliamentary system. We're saying, OK, I'm going to give you the authority. I'm going to have my little vote. And that's you know, going to be as far as I'm willing to participate, you know, unless I want to make it my business and try to have a bigger impact. Um, and generally, we're all in agreement. You know, uh, of course, when you get into politics, there's fierce opposition on all sides. But that's, that's I think, perfectly natural. OK, so that's social consensus. And it's like messy, but we have this system. And presumably, it's working a little bit. Right? But what do we do in a digital network? Right? So we take what we know about social consensus, and we say, what happens in a digital manner? So we'll go through a simple example here of an ATM machine. So for my ATM machine, it's going to be a network. Now, a network is only going to have two nodes. So we've got a bank server, and we've got the ATM machine. And we think about like the process of withdrawing some money from the ATM. And we could break it down into a few steps. Right? You've got a request. $100, and then the bank server has to respond and say that, yeah, your account can be debited by $100. And then the ATM is going to come back with another round of messaging. It's going to ask now to withdraw $100. And then the response will be, OK, you are now free to dispense the cash. And there might even be another round trip in here, which is, did the cash get dispensed? OK. Not OK. If not OK, we might have to do um, 
some other error management. And so we've got these rounds of communication that are happening between the nodes. And fast forwarding to a blockchain, all a blockchain is doing is having these communication of messages between people. That's all, that's all a ledger of accounts is, right? It's communication between people on agreement of money. Okay, and so then we can look back at this and say, well, when does the bank actually debit the money from my account, right? And you can imagine if I only had $50 and I request 100, there's going to be some point in the process that I'm not allowed to withdraw the money. And so the bank is probably, after they respond yes, by bank I mean the bank server here, is probably debiting my account such that my account now has $100 less before the money comes out. Okay, and I think we would agree that debiting my account after the money comes out could be, could be tricky. If I take the cash and I walk away, but maybe my account doesn't update until overnight, now I've got $100 in hand, and in my account, I still have $100. Okay, and then you know, tomorrow morning, things will balance. Um, and these are the types of updating that digital systems have to do all the time. And uh, you know, I, even with our modern banks, we get like the messages that we can't process things on the weekend, or that like it's it's holding in your account, but it's not really gone just yet. So all of this is part of consensus. Now, if we make the network a little bit more complicated, so really, the ATM is a whole network, and so we've got multiple machines here, and they all need to contact. The bank, the machines might not be run by the same company or the same bank, right? Most ATMs are not run by the bank itself, but they connect into a bank such that you know the bank they don't want to deal with having to run the ATM network themselves. So in a distributed system here now, we still have a centralized server, but overall we're distributed with many nodes. And what the bank is doing, it's saying, well. You could even have like ATMs side by side, right? In a busy area, busy part of town. The bank needs to make sure that I can't take my card out of one machine and go to the next before the first machine updates the balance. I don't want me running down the row withdrawing $100 at each one before it gets updated. And it doesn't have to be you know, physically close together. There have been scams uh, and frauds perpetuated where uh, in the network at the same time, multiple people are withdrawing, trying to withdraw money. So the bank now is tasked with maintaining a state of truth in the ledger. And this is in uh, distributed systems language here. State of truth in the ledger. It doesn't have to be money, but money is um, easy to understand. So by state of truth, we mean like we look at the state of the system. So that's, that could be balances, but it could also be, well, the state of my slides here. I had trouble opening it. These pictures weren't showing up. Uh, they were showing up right when I was in WZ 20 minutes ago, but they weren't showing up here. So the system, something happened in between those two states when I connected to the network here. So that's a state, is that my file is stored in the cloud storage, right? And everywhere I access it, we want to be able to get the same state that we are expecting. So that's, that's managing the truth in the ledger. So if you do a quick search for ATM fraud or ATM theft, um, you know this also, I wouldn't say it's common, but it does happen because ATMs are networks built by people and they need to get software updates also built by people. Uh, so I did a quick search today. Bank of Ireland sees customers queue for free cash. So customers were able to withdraw 1,000 euros right, when their account didn't have 1,000 euros in them and through word of mouth, it was like, hey, go down and you can withdraw money even if your account only has 20 euros in it, right? essentially going into overdraft without seeing the update you know, on screen or in your app at the time. Uh, ATM frenzy after 1,000 euros added to, added to accounts, the banks responded and said, tomorrow morning we're going to update everyone's balances. And of course, you know, the people don't have any power in this situation. It's not like, not like in the game of Monopoly where you collect a bank error in your favor. Um, sometimes in life, there are bank errors in your favor, and those are good days. This, this would have not been a good day if you didn't have much money and you thought, hey, I now have some. Uh, and a much more famous one and a much more elaborate one is called the Lazarus Heist. I encourage you to look it up. This, 
is from the BBC and they did a podcast uh, and there's a book about this as well. So the Lazarus Group is a North Korean hacker group and they coordinated this heist on an Indian bank ATM network and they got all these people, um, they got, they, they've, they were able to get malware into the ATM network, which then turned off the switch that checked that the account had money before dispensing the cash. So they turned that off. So you could put in your card, you know, dispense the maximum daily limit, uh, you know, whatever, $2,000 or 10,000 rupees, uh, and it wouldn't check that your account had the requisite funds. And so these ATMs, for a period of time, were able to spill out money without doing that check. Um, they were able to do this by a phishing scam, so an employee opened an innocuous email and, and they got phished. Um, and then they had to go, because they couldn't override the limit, right, the daily cash limit, then they had to go recruit lots of money mules and create fake debit cards and give them to all these people. And it, it's a crazy story. It occurred, they stole money from like 28 different countries. And then afterwards, they had all this cash from different countries in all different denominations. Um, you know, to get that network back into, you know, just a real, but it was an ATM network fraud.